I'm uh, the <coughs> treasurer of the English Teachers Association of Switzerland, where I'm based, and I'm also the BSIG coordinator there. And before I turn over to the panelists, while well, I can still get a word in, <laughs> I'd just like to give my perspective on this topic. Uh, as some of you may know, on the teacher training discussion group for IATEFL, Scott Thornberry last summer started a discussion with the sentence, teaching with technology is a difficult thing to do well. And that unleashed a storm. <laughs> a very interesting discussion ensued. And I'd just like to say that, speaking for myself, I love technology. I Twitter and tweet, and I'm on Facebook, and I use a lot of technology in my in-company classes. But I'm also currently running a project in Zimbabwe at some schools, supporting some schools there and teacher and doing teacher training, uh, where teaching unplugged is a given. So it's also possible to teach with nothing but what's in our students' heads. And that's all I'm going to actually say now. I'm going to let the panelists each introduce themselves. And also, sorry, Vicki, I'd like to also give, have everybody give Eric a round of applause for all of his work. He's really sorry you couldn't be here today, but we understand why he's not. But we should all give him a round of applause, please. Right, teaching and learning in the future. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much about technology per se, because we had uh, another panel discussion yesterday which really focused very heavily and pretty much exclusively on technology. Um, but I think technology is a part of how teaching and learning is going to um, develop. Let me first say that, that I don't think um, that all teaching and all learning will happen through or via or using technology. I think for many students and possibly also for many teachers, um, the classroom situation will be the ultimate desirable. But um, there are huge um, numbers of people out there who just don't have that luxury of being able to set foot into a classroom, um, whether it's because there aren't teachers physically nearby or because it's too costly or whatever. Um, so technology will play a role in it. One of the fascinating things that I think are, are already happening or going to continue happening um, is that there is an increased blurring between teaching and learning um, and between the teacher and the learner. Um, the, there used to be a very clear distinction. Um, there was the teacher in the classroom, the, that person did the teaching and the learners did the learning. With the communicative approach, um, those boundaries began to, learn, uh, began to be blurred already with students working in pairs, teaching each other, developing the language skills together. That, I think, um, is happening even more and more now um, due to technology, um, but also because of the, uh, a whole change in, in, in mindset. Um, what we really see going on already is a lot more peer teaching, peer learning. Um, we have whole infrastructures, um, um, like, like Live Mocha, for example, um, where people where learners come together. One person says, I'm a native French speaker. Somebody else says, I'm a native Spanish speaker. Let's teach each other. And um, that sort of model where basically the teacher is completely removed from the teaching and learning environment, but teaching and learning still does take place. <coughs> um, so that's, that's uh, to me, that's where I'm, keep, what, what I'm really going to keep my eye on. Um, the, the, the blurring of boundaries between who the teacher is, who the learner is, um, and the peer-to-peer -peer teaching. Um, basically, I, I think the whole learning and teaching environment is going to be richer. Um, people have more access to um, authentic materials, to other humans on the other side of the planet. Um, costs have come right down. I mean, what I'm doing right now, I'm speaking to you with video. Um, you know, ten years ago, doing this by telephone would have been horrifically expensive. Today, doing it with video is free. Um, so that's going to that, that's coming into play. Um, so te technology does have its, its role to play. Hello, I'm Petra Pointner. I'm speaking today from a teacher's perspective. Um, I, I'm a technophile and I use a lot of modern technology in um, the classroom. And I'm very lucky in that, as, that I work at a university that is very well endowed. So I have all the equipment I do need in order you know, to work with wikis and blogs and, and Twitter and all these things. And, um, uh, I mean, very enthusiastic about using new technologies in the classroom. I have found, however, that uh, my students, who are probably the 
um, prototypical digital natives that Mark Frensky is um, speaking of, um, are often quite reluctant to try out new things with me. If I tell them, you know, I would like to do an experiment with Skype, let's do this, or for example, I'm now um, doing a big project on Twitter in the classroom, um, I sometimes have the impression that they look at me and wonder and think I'm a bit mad. Why would I be doing this? Um, they, what they, what I found is that they don't like using technology just for technology's sake. Um, and um, I therefore try to limit the technology, um, not to a minimum, but I really only use it when I think it adds value to the lesson. And um, um, yeah, well, basically, and if I look at the um, at the uh, evaluations that I get at the end of the uh, semester, um, I have found that um, the evaluations weren't better if I used a lot of technology in the classroom. That has always surprised me because I thought, you know, technology adds a lot more fun to the lessons, and I find it is a lot more fun. But um, yeah, maybe the students do see it differently. If I ask them about it, they tell me, most of my students are engineers, they tell me, I already spend all day in front of the computer screen and I uh, do use um, Facebook and Twitter and other things in my free time um, and you are now <coughs> obliging me to spend even more time in front of the computer. So um, I think we should be a bit more we are careful with the use of technology in the classroom. As I said, I do make use of it extensively, um, but um, I sometimes think publishers as well shouldn't get overexcited. Um, investing a lot of money in, for example, developing products for mobile phones, um, video games and so on. I'm really keen on trying this out and uh, uh, I am enthusiastic about it, but um, we should also be realistic. Ian McMaster, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Business Spotlight uh, magazine, and as a publisher I will try not to get overexcited here. <laughs> uh, I agree with a number of the things that Petra says. I think to summarise, how will we be teaching, here's a forecast, not a recommendation, we'll be teaching in the ways we want to teach. How will the learners be learning? They'll be learning in the ways they want to learn. And ultimately, because they are the customers, they will trump us. So, for me, the key thing is, how would the learners want to learn? And uh, there's a bit of a problem like that, because that's already put everybody in one, in one category. Um, so I'm very suspicious of any sentence that starts off, learners want, or the learner wants, because we teach in other contexts the fact that people are so different in their learning styles, and then we jump on a, you know, whichever's the latest bandwagon that's heading out of town. So, I think, uh, as an industry, what we need is, uh, we need visionaries, but as a kind of intermediaries, and uh, between, uh, the publishers also are, so the, for the, uh, between the kind of the visionaries and the, the end customer, if you like, we have a, an important role of, of sort of healthy scepticism, and also keeping our eyes open and really think, what do the learners want? Otherwise, you, you're in the danger of coming in the classic situation where we go in there teaching with whatever methods, whether it's technology or, or uh, other uh, teaching methodologies, um, and are we actually giving the learners what they want? Because ultimately, they to, they'll decide. Just to give you one small example, maybe to finish from our own sort of portfolio at uh, Spotlight for Lark, where we produce a whole range of um, products, you know, from sort of old-fashioned dead wood, um, magazines to uh, you know through to um, you know podcasts and blogs and on online things. But if you just take the the one area of our audio CDs, which used to be the cassette and became the CD, you can also download it from the website. But how many people actually do download it? What percentage of the total um, you know sort of four thousand uh, CDs a month or subscriptions a month? It's about ten percent. It's increasing slowly but it hasn't taken off, it's not 50%, it's not 80%, it's not even 30%. And that's the, actually the percentage of, um, if you look at the, the whole audio book market, again, the digital component of that at the moment is around 10%, or it was a year ago, maybe a little bit higher now. So we need the visionaries, we need the skeptical intermediaries, and we need to keep our eyes focused on how do learners want to learn, and my suggestion is that will be a whole range of different ways.